Lovely. Thank you all very much for coming this evening. Uh, my name's Amy and I work at October Books in Southampton. Um, thank you for coming. We're here uh, this evening to hear about Unofficial Britain, Journeys Through Unexpected Places with Gareth E. Rees. Uh, this is a book about a Britain that exists outside of the official histories and guidebooks. Um, and I, for one, am very, very much looking forward to it. A little bit before we start, um, uh, I work at October Books and October Books is Southampton's only radical independent bookshop and we're also a cooperative. Been going since 1977, which is over 40 years, which is pretty good going. Um, as well as books like Gareth's, um, we also sell fair trade and ethical food and household items, um, uh, which is great because that means that we do actually count as an essential business. So we're, we're open during lockdown, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and we've also set up an online shop people to uh, click and collect on their food and household items. We also have a storefront on Bookshop, which you may well have heard about, which I'll also put a link to in the chat box. Ordinarily, a talk like this would be held in our community space, which sadly is shut. Um, but since lockdown the first time round, we've been holding our events online uh, via Zoom, which has been absolutely fantastic. It's meant that more people have been able to attend and also audiences from all over the globe, which has been absolutely fantastic. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. You will have heard me saying it again and again at the start. If you can remain on mute, that would be lovely. It just means that everybody gets to enjoy the, the talk this evening. If you have any uh, questions uh, or queries, just put them in the chat box and I'll field them at the end. I'll also be putting some links in the chat box. Uh, and if you, if you do enjoy the talk and would like to donate to October Books and help us do more, I'll put a link to PayPal in there as well suggested donation, maybe three pounds, if you really like it a bit more, is not going to be turned away. I am recording this talk this evening. The only people that will be recorded are those who are speaking, so that will be um, myself and Gareth. So if you remain on mute, your privacy is entirely intact, there won't be a picture of your face, nothing will be captured whatsoever. Um, so it is an absolute pleasure to introduce Gareth Rees, who will be speaking about unofficial Britain, journeys through unexpected places. He says, here is a Britain that, out, that exists outside of the official histories and guidebooks, places that lie on the margins left behind, a Britain in the cracks of the urban facade where unexpected life can flourish. This is a land of industrial estates, factories and electricity pylons, of motorways and ring roads, of hospitals and housing estates, of roundabouts and flyovers, places where modern life speeds past, but where people and stories nevertheless collect, places where human dramas play out, stories of love, violence, fear, boredom and artistic, artistic expression. Places of ghost sightings, first kisses, experiments with drugs, refuges for the homeless, hangouts for the outcasts. Struck by the power of these stories and experiences, Gareth E. Rees set out to explore these places and the essential part they paid, played in the history and geography of our isles. Though mundane and neglected, they can be as powerfully influential on in our lives and imaginations as any picture postcard tourist destination. This is unofficial Britain, a personal journey along the landscape, along the edges of a landscape brimming with mystery, folklore and myth. Gareth is the um, founder of the Unofficial Britain website and the author of three books, Marshland, The Stone Tide and Car Park Life, all of which you will be able to order from us at October Books. Born in Germany, brought up in Scotland and the north of England, he lived in London for many years before moving to Hastings. The modern myths and folklore of places have always driven his writing, which includes horror and weird fiction tales with numerous anthologies, including This Dreaming Isle and The Best of British Fantasy. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Gareth. Over to you. Thank you. Well, that was a good blurb. Uh, so I don't really need to do the beginning bit now, which means I can get straight to it. So I'm going to start with the sexiest of all things, which is a, uh, here we go, a chimney. So this is me with the rugby ball on the right and my brother uh, in the 80s uh, in Glossop in Derbyshire, which is where I grew up and moved there in 79, 1980 and lived there for 10 years. We were in this sort of new build, well it wasn't new build, it was kind of 60s build, uh, housing estate on the outskirts of town. And we ne lived next to a scrubby field and at the other end of the field, which you can see in the background, is a factory, which is the Ferris Alloys factory in Glossop. That chimney, was built only three years before I moved there. But when I arrived, it felt like it'd been there forever. When you're a kid, you don't really think about that kind of history. Things have just always been there. And so that chimney was, uh, I could see it every single day. It was there in the field where I played. 
it was there when we traveled through the state pass it was there when we came into town it told us where we were it was an icon of the town and my entire childhood memories grew up around it the, the chimney itself stank and released this terrible poisonous horrible toxic fumes uh, sulfur dioxide that used to invade the town to the point where people had to close the doors and windows and hide inside but for me it was something that that, that was exciting it looked like a space rocket it had this twirly snake-like motif going up it, which reminded me of the snake pass, which you can see in the distance. And I thought for somehow they were, they were the same thing, the snake being this deadly mythic creature. Uh, we weren't allowed to go to that factory. So where you can see where the rail, electric where, railway line is, that's the line that goes from Manchester. That was the borderland. That was the threshold. We weren't allowed to go on the other side because the other side was kind of junkyards and bits of trading estate and the factory itself. And there was a story that I remember from the time that when I asked about it, my mum swears she didn't tell me it, but it was that there was a dog that was strayed too near to the railway line and was hit by a train and its neck was severed and its head rolled down the hill into the, into the estate on the other side. Now, that story really stuck with me. And it was, for me, the, the headless dog was the reason why you shouldn't go across the railway line into the factory. And as I was writing this book, I got to think about that story and I asked around and I thought, was it even true? Was this headless dog something that was told to me by my mum or a friend's parent to stop us from going into the dangerous place? And if it was the case, then what the headless dog was, was a piece of contemporary urban folklore, because this was exactly the kind of story that would have emerged in the days where it was children were warned not to go to the spooky wood, the kind of Hansel and Gretel thing because of the witch that lurked there. And it got me thinking about stories that we tell about the places where we live when we grow up, particularly as children, the way we think about them, but as adults too, the way we kind of tell stories about them and how myths are really important. Um, many years later, when I moved next to the Hackney Marshes, I started to roam around this edge land that was very similar in a, in a bigger scale to this sort of edge land that I lived down in as a kid. And that too was haunted by a, uh, there was head, two headless bears were found in the River Lee in the uh, early 80s. And a year later, a bear was seen by some children while they were playing snowballs on the Hackney Marsh and the football pitches. And this bear kind of attacked them. And this became a, um, a mythic story that continued for years in the marshes. There were these constant sightings of this bear. Uh, and it was similarly the same thing. It felt like it was expressing something about London's relationship to this wild space on the edge of town. Uh, and again, it was a piece of contemporary folklore. It appeared in a Jasper Carrot uh, thing, and it appeared in songs, and it appeared in films, and, and it's effectively taken on a life of its own. This is kind of what, it, what interested me, the fact that these things can spring up in what you might call mundane or everyday places. So like this sort of factory with a brand new chimney could be equally as terrifying as folkloric and as strange and as mythic as an ancient Victorian factory. And I was thinking about folklore and oral tradition and how we attach stories to places. So we tend to think of folklore as the spooky well that, that the, the monk fell down on, the, that strange woodland, that ancient piece of pasture land where the civil war happened. We think it might be, you know, a, a kind of a, a rural, a rural past, like an idyllic rural England. However, there's a plenty of folklore that came after that. For example, the Industrial Revolution, which must have seemed hideous and super modern and completely traumatic at the time to people. These huge monstrosities of buildings, there's fast, super fast train travel, complete revolution in the way people kind of act and behave. And the super modern really hitting the Victorians hard. They still created a kind of a, their own mythic sort of uh, structures. So they had stories about Spring Hill Jack in London. There was the Jack the Ripper mythology. There were sort of alien invasions. There was the vampire fear of, of sexually transmitted disease and worries about what immigration and changes in culture were doing to society. And since the Victorian times, we've not really, we've, we've romanticized and sentimentalized these old industrial super modern structures to the point where we don't think anything weird about a haunted viaduct from where the woman fell and we don't think anything weird about a haunted signal box in a railway, in a Victorian railway, or we don't feel, we don't feel strange to feel haunted in a Victorian terrace house. Um, but in the same way as these things have become mythological. I think this is what's happening to structures in the second half of the 20th century, which, although we kind of think of them as, as, as modern and contemporary, they're really getting old and worn. And most people alive now don't remember a time before electricity pylons. Uh, motorways and service stations are part of the structure of where we live and our memories and, and how we've lived our lives. Our biographies are completely laid out along this completely new sort of topography and new urban space. 
and it's had enough time to bed in, it's had enough time for deaths and tragedies and sexual awakenings and experiences to sort of infest and grow in them, which I think has created a real rich vein of culture in Britain that hasn't quite yet been tapped into or not yet recognised. It's what I call the first shoots of future folklore. And that's what I tried to do in Unofficial Britain. I didn't want to just write a psychogeographic book where I go to various ruinous places in the edges of town and sort of lament them. Or I wanted to talk about places where we live and how we really live in these places and what they mean to us uh, and, and bring it back into places like the housing estate and the chimney and the edge of your field near, near, near where you live and that waste ground behind the house. Places that people kind of use for various reasons every day, like everyday places, as, as weird as they might be. Um, so that was the idea of the book. I went on a sort of series of journeys last last year, whatever, last century it seems, but anyway, the time before all the business happened. Uh, and I kind of started to look at random places just on the map and just go and see what they were like. I didn't try and, and pinpoint a bunch of stories uh, at the obscure weirdest places in Britain, the 10 most unusual industrial estates. I just thought anywhere is interesting. Everything is interesting. Everything has some kind of capacity to be interesting because wherever people and human beings touch place, it seems to create some kind of frisson uh, and creates its own mythology and stories, even if they're stories that are only private or amongst small groups of communities and they're not really publicized. Um, so I was thinking about places like, I'm gonna show you my screen. That's the headless dog, by the way. Um, motorways, motorways, bridges, motorway service stations. These kind of strange interchanges on the edges of town, tower blocks and uh, housing estates, multi-story car parks, underpasses, and uh, other kind of weird subterranean interlocking systems that we have in our towns that we walk through on the way to get our shopping or the way out from the car park, but how harbor their own strange mystery. Um, these are places I think uh, we need to kind of discuss and, and talk about. What do they mean? They're, they're sometimes contentious places. They're places that can bring crime and pollution uh, and, and fear, uh, but they also have their own strange magic. So I wanted to interrogate it without uh, romanticizing it too much. I wanted to look and explore them. So I'm going to take you on, on, a, on a few of these journeys. So one of them uh, I begin with is the humble electricity pylon, which uh, you know, there's a lot of them around and they're in every town, they cross crisscross the country and they kind of mostly look the same. Um, but when I lived by the Hackney Marshes, I had this sort of weird, weird affair with a electricity pylon that was in the filter beds, Victorian filter beds, and had this sort of strange majesty because it was away from the others, it was out of rank. And it was in, it was overlooking these strange ceramic fish heads and a pond that reflected its reflection. And there was little fires and joint butts and things from other people who used to sit around it at night. And I wrote a story about a guy who becomes uh, obsessed with the pylon to the point where when it's felled in order to clean up the marshes for the Olympics, he's so obsessed with it, it's like he's like a, a person protecting an old oak tree uh, and becomes like a sort of pylon version of a tree hugger and straps himself to it, armed up, tooled up with weapons. But I thought, why shouldn't someone love a pylon? And people can say that they love a place, they love something, why can't they love a car? Uh, a pylon necessarily isn't different. And pylons have got their own strange folklore as well. So in the book, I talk about uh, David Southwell's Hookland pro project, which uh, posits a, a cult called the Children of the Hum, who follow, who got lost after a, a festival in 1969 and follow the electric ley lines of the pylons throughout the country. There's an artist called Maxim Griffin, who in his early works had these pylons juxtaposed with Neolithic circles, uh, sort of trying to juxtapose the idea of the worship of sun gods with, you know, because the pylons themselves come from this ancient Egypt Egypt thing of um, the, the pylons that were on either side of the Nile that channeled the sun as it rose. Uh, the pylon shape is supposed to that pyramidal thing at the top is from a, a design that's supposed to channel the sun's rays in ancient Egypt. Uh, you can see that on Cleopatra's needle, for example. So pylons have their own kind of, uh, I guess, mythology anyway. Um, in the 1980s uh, in Stocksbridge, not too far from where I grew up, where that picture is, there was a strange event that I'm going to read to you about. So Stocksbridge is just north of Sheffield on the M1, uh, where the, you cross the Pennines towards Manchester. There was a huge load of uh, congestion there, so they decided to build a bypass in 1987. And as they dug deep into the soil, cutting into the rock, some believe they disturbed spirits of the dead. One night in September at around 12.30 a.m. on the construction site, the supervisor received a panic call from two security guards working the late shift. Stephen Brooks and David Goldthorpe had noticed movement by the side of a road called Peroid Lane, not far from the steelworks, and they went over to investigate. As they entered the muddy field, they saw the children 
dressed in old fashioned garb, skipping and dancing in a circle around an electricity pylon, singing the nursery rhyme, Ring of Roses. But as the security guards drew closer, the kids vanished. When they arrived at the spot beneath the pylon, there was no sign of them, no footprints in the mud, no tracks, no churned earth to suggest anybody had been there at all. And when the guards talked to construction workers staying in caravans overnight near the site, some said they too had heard children's laughter. So there is a haunted pylon. Uh, and if a pylon can be haunted, what else can be haunted? Well, one of the things I looked at was uh, the industrial, uh, sorry, the housing estates, the sort of the newer build late 20th century housing estates, which you know can be considered mundane, uh, maybe without history or lacking in, in, in kind of majesty. Uh, but one of the places I looked at was called Nunsthorpe Estate, which is in Grimsby. Um, and in the 1980s, just north of the estate, this, this estate is on an old sort of religious land. So that's why it's called Nunsthorpe. Uh, it's at the site of the nunnery. It was, this, these were all the fields that were around the site. So maybe not untypically then, in, I think it was in 1980, a guy called Robin Furman was going upstairs of his house. And at the top of this house, he saw a nun with no face. Uh, as he went up to try and get close to the nun vanished. He became so obsessed with this, uh, he, he did a degree in psychology and philosophy, and in order to kind of carry out his thesis, he created the Grimsby Ghostbusters, which was a team of psychic investigators, uh, basically a bunch of his mates, uh, a mic electronics engineer, computer consultant, a microbiologist and a photographer. Uh, they had a 1959 mayoral limousine, uh, which was their kind of Ghostbusters call-out vehicle, and they were accompanied to give it a Scooby-Doo twist by a 14-stone Newfoundland dog. Um, they would jump into the car and go off to sort of solve crimes. These uh, sort of ghost crimes. These were not in ancient mansions. These were all in sort of mundane places in, in Grimsby, uh, a, a haunted shoe shop, a haunted car auction house, and in several occasions, set, sort of haunted semi-detached uh, uh, estate buildings in places like Nunthorpe. And in fact, in Nunsthorpe in the 1980s, there were two major poltergeist incidents in this estate you can see here. Uh, one in which the, the headless, uh, sorry, not headless, he was a monk with um, iron chains and metal spikes around his neck. He terrorized the family over a course of months, uh, dragging a girl upstairs. And there was another one about three years later. This was a nun-like figure. Uh, and they're to the point where both families were on the verge of moving. And they kind of hit the local press and we had, you know, these are the kind of classic stories you get quite commonly now, the, the, the guys. and they tend to be in these new buildings. I would go as far as to say the poltergeist is the ghost of the new build on the modern housing estate. When I went back to the uh, estate to have a look around, it was quite eerie, it was December and it was a quiet day, but I had this sort of strange feeling that those chain links reminded me of the monk's necklace. Langton Drive was the thing was rusted and disappearing. The, there was a pub with absolutely no sign, like a faceless pub sign. There was a guy standing in the entrance, but you couldn't tell whether it was he was like alive or a ghost or not. It was quite, it was quite spectral. But I was fully aware that my brain was absolutely chock-a-block full of headless nuns. Um, I, I write about it a little bit here about my theory about why this is. I was fully aware that my perspective was under the influence of stories about dissolved priories, faceless nuns, disturbed monks and poltergeists. What I'd read about nuns thought had fermented in my imagination to produce these sensations, intensified by expectation, enchanted by a chilly December twilight at the thinning of the day. But isn't this how we experience a place? For a place is more than bricks and mortar. It is more than a map. It is more than a bunch of articles about social deprivation and sneery lists of Britain's worst towns. A place is made of stories you read and rumours you hear. It is made of prejudices and anxieties shaped by your past experiences. It is an atmosphere, a synchronicity of light, sound, smell, texture and temperature. It is a memory triggered in the deep recesses of your subconscious. It's a horror from your past, an anxiety from your present, a desire for your future. It is a projection of your state of mind, which can make manifest the invisible, animate the inanimate and imbue even the dullest modern house with a sinister energy. Maybe less expected uh, is the haunting of industrial estates. So one of the other targets I had was to basically walk around some of these kind of trading estates and industrial estates you get at the site at the edges of town. And um, one of them was Greenock, which is a uh, on the uh, Fort of Clyde, west of Glasgow, Scotland. 
And this old, old industrial town that was responsible for making torpedoes during the wars and it hit hard times in the 70s and 80s and went into decline. And there's a rumours of a character who haunts the Dellingburn industrial estate just near the Morrison's car park behind the railway lines. And he's called Catman. This is a picture of him here. A Catman may or may not exist. I know there's a picture of him, but this is this is a character who's been sighted in the area, the industrial areas of Greenwich since the 1970s. Um, and like a Spring Hill Jack, really, for the Scottish industrial town. And he only started to be photographed in the, back, in the, in the 2000s when people had sort of phones with them. And, and it began to be a thing that teenagers particularly seemed to be photographing, which made people think that it might, it might be a hoax. So he lives in this sort of ripped up bit of uh, fencing and there's a kind of sort of strange micro forest behind the bus depot. And he, when people leave food for him, like offerings of McDonald's or something, he kind of crawls out, but he also eats rats. Um, now, one of the, there was a, a role in Greenock in the 19, in the, basically in the shipbuilding era, in the industrial era, called the Catman. And the Catman's job was effectively he'd be a kind of homeless guy uh, who was, lived around the area who they'd give food and shelter to in order for him to look after the cats. And the wrecked cats would keep the rat population down. This Catman may have been one who'd gone rogue, a bit like a Japanese fighter in the forest long after the, 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 in the jungle after the wars ended, still kind of carrying on a war that's not really happening. Maybe he's still trying to control the population, but he keeps getting seen and he's a kind of mythic character because the council have insisted he doesn't exist and that he's an urban met legend, yet people still uh, take photos like this. This is him with the rat in his mouth underneath the bus in the bus depot. I went to have a look myself. So this is the Dellingburn estate. It's all crowned in barbed wire. You can hear the usual clangs and bangs. Industrial estates have this strange eerie magic about them because you can never really hear where the sounds are coming from. You can never really tell who's supposed to be there or what even is being made in there. Mounds of materials, people coming and going, clangs and bangs. At the back of it, with all this kind of noise and hullabaloo, was this oasis of calm with this leafy area and this old cobbled street. And this is Scott's Lane where he's said to haunt. Uh, the left side there is the, uh, the fencing where you saw the photo before. So I came to one of these openings. I thought I'll go in and have a look. Um, and it's quite strange when you go to an industrial estate near a Morrison's car park and suddenly feel like you're in a completely different world. This was a strange, like, um, I don't know, like you expect Yoda to model out of one of these little enclaves here, these sort of mossy bivouacs made from fallen trees where the roots have come up, strange gas canisters strewn around. There was all sorts of signs of like uh, people using, you know, robbing, robbing wallets and then coming here to try and find the loot. This one had a strange cocaine-y, weird, speedy paste all over it. Um, so when I pulled out these cards, I suddenly had this stuff in my hands. And I was really on tenterhooks while I was in here, which is ridiculous. But, uh, you know, I was hardly stout stalking the Yeti in the Himalayas, but I was just in a Scottish industrial state. But it was, it feels like that. Sometimes when I've noticed this in Hackney Marshes, you sometimes just take a left and you go through a fence and by the side of the reservoir, by the side of the railway lines, and, find, and feel like you'd entered a completely different space. It's a kind of liminal space between, between functions, between areas, between states of mind. Um, and in folklore, these would be known as thin places. These are the places where you do see beasts and legends. Uh, and in an industrial state in Hull, for example, um, there's a beast called Old Stinker, who's a werewolf, who was seen snatching a Alsatian, leaping over the fence and disappearing. And he is said to be some remnant of our guilt for our killing of the wolves. So that, was, that enclave near Hull was where the last wolves in Britain existed. And some people have posited we've got some kind of collective guilt. So we keep seeing these sort of monstrous wolf-like creations seeping through the layers of time. Uh, when I came out of that uh, bit of industrial estate, there was actually a poster for Catman's Greenock, which is a really good film about Catman made by some locals. And there was a couple of films, in fact, and he really is becoming, Captain Kidd was from Greenock, but I wager in about 100 years time, more people will remember Catman. I think Catman is the new Captain Kidd of Greenock. Um, other places of interest uh, for me were uh, underpasses and uh, motorway junctions, flyovers. So this is the M junction three of the M32 in Bristol. Um, this is one of the, the places where I genuinely didn't know what to expect. This was a photograph taken on the actual research walk. There's my friends, uh, Nick and Mark in front, uh, both from Bristol and who haven't, you know, just said, well, let's just have a walk around this junction. It's really close to his house in St. Paul's. This motorway was really important because it, it, it cut through the city and completely destroyed the multicultural community living there. It's like a concrete river running 
through uh, St. Paul's and St. Werburgh's and those kind of areas. Um, and it's a very noisy, deep trench of traffic. It's a motorway, but it's only about you know, like a dual carriageway, really. This is the junction that whirls the traffic up from that and sort of spins it around and heads it off into Bristol. So when you go through this sort of circular mound, it's a little bit like some kind of Neolithic site through these chambers full of graffiti. Um, I got to this, which was a shrine. Um, bearing in mind, I was thinking the ideas of folklore and, and motorway junctions. This was a bit obvious, but there it was. I didn't put it there. Um, it had nuts and fruits and seeds in the, in the bowl. It's a bit of a palimpsest, so people have added things. This guy, Mr. Universe, has had, had, had added his thing. There's an Extinction Rebellion thing. When I went back another time, it had been painted a completely different colour, a kind of green colour. So it's constantly changing, being added to by the locals. And these offerings are to what? I'm not really sure. If someone was to look at this in a thousand years' time, they might posit that this was some great causeway with a kind of Stonehenge ritualistic site in the middle of the circle where people came to smoke joints and get high and leave offerings to the gods. Just up from that, right over the motorway itself is this. I found this, which was this you know, doll entwined with the, um, the fence behind it with daffodils in a lap. Usually you'd think this was a memorial for someone who died, but there was no signs of that. It was a strangely folkloric object to find there. We kind of stared at it for a while and just thought, what, is, what does it mean? It was, it was really it's disturbing, discombobulating to see it, but quite exciting as well, because even if it was there as a prank, even if it was someone just found it and put it there, it feels that some people are engaging with this junction in a way that isn't just about it as a motorway junction. It isn't just about its infrastructural properties. It's got something else that means something to the locals. When I returned there uh, for a sort of follow-up research to talk to a journalist from the Bristol Post, this had appeared, an actual standing stone, as if someone was adding to my thoughts on it already with a kind of sort of faux Neolithic structure. Um, as I was looking at this, a woman with a dustbuster hoover came up to me. Um, she was just wandering around with it and asked me to open it. I couldn't open it, so she said, you must be able to open it. You're a man. Um, I couldn't. So it was all a bit of a panicky situation with her glaring at me by the standing stone. And she said, this standing stone is a travesty because they put it here to stop us parking. And she was started to rant about the junction itself and how it was so polluted and full of crime. And it kind of got me thinking about how emotive these places are. And these are really where it's all where sort of art and sculpture and strange Neolithic throwbacks and contemporary politics and, and urban politics are all kind of clashing in this weird place. Um, so it's, it's a, a really interesting junction, and one that you wouldn't necessarily think to go to, certainly not as a destination. As I was looking through, there were these strange book records or recommendations for esoteric uh, teachers like P, Manly P. Hall and Arnold Ayer. One's a naturopath, another one's does, does a, a sort, of, sort of cosmic kind of ordering thing. So they're all the, the book recommendations and spiritual recommendations are all existing in this odd space that loads of people are using at one time for loads of different reasons. It feels like that's, it's full of life and it, 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 you can find out as much about the Britain that we live in through a place like this than anywhere else. I also looked at multi-stories. This is, uh, my dad comes from Wrexham in North Wales. And so this is the St. Mark's um, multi-story car park, which is bolted onto uh, a shopping center. This was originally the site of a church. So a lot of the places I look at in the book are overlaying on top on, on ancient places, often religious places, places where things have happened. And this maybe accounts for some of the eeriness and some of the ghosts that seep through the layers. Um, St. Mark's was built on the site of a church and is also a church. So it, one of the, the, the deals for knocking the church down was they would build another one. But the, the church is effectively part of the multi-story car park part of the shopping center. So you can sort of go into church via shoe zone and then you can come up to the top of the multi-story and gaze out across the spire um, and sort of walk around it. So it was a strangely religious multi-story car park. Um, then when I went inside, there were these sort of satanic upside down crosses and all kinds of, uh, there was pentagrams and, and various sort of symbols that suggested there was some kind of interaction with the religious quality of the place. And the very, it, it was creepy on its own just without any of the graffiti. There's this sort of, a lot of these multi-stories are getting old and worn and they're collapsing under the weight of themselves. This is like creeping stains and strange blobs of stuff everywhere, kind of ghostly shimmerings. So they're kind of eerie places. I mean, the cliche is the, the eerie car park where you're walking at night and you hear footsteps behind you and they're used in films and stuff a lot like that. But they genuinely are like uh, old haunted castles now. In fact, in the book, I talk about them as concrete castles. They're kind of these weird outposts on most urban areas, a bit like Norman castles were that we've kind of grown familiar with and they're getting worn by the wind and the rain and lots of events happen there. People sleep in them, people take drugs in them, people use them for all sorts of reasons and that are not just for car parks. 
and whether we like it or not, they've become ingrained on our on our psyche. Um, and to the point where in Welbeck in London, Welbeck Car Park in London, there was a campaign to save it because it was so important architecturally, but also for the community and the people who live there. It's almost like a piece of it would dis disappear, uh, a piece of culture would disappear if the car park disappeared. Um, the same happened with the chimney I talked about in Glossop. When I went back recently, that chimney that chimney has now been demolished, and Glossop felt completely different to me. It was the town was not the same, and I know a lot of people hated that chimney, but and for good or bad, that was a piece of, that was a piece missing uh, from my memory. Um, going back to standing stones again, uh, another one of my targets were things like roundabouts, which you get uh, now with sculpture on them. They've become become the increasingly becoming pockets of kind of cultural law. People are putting architectural sculpture on them or, or advertising on them, or there's one in Bristol called the Black Cat, that's uh, not in Bristol, so in, in Bedfordshire called the Black Cat Roundabout, for example, which has a, a sign with the Black Cat on it. And that was uh, because there was to be a, a place there called the Black Cat, a garage. And that Black Cat keeps going and disappearing and coming back and being stolen and getting bigger and smaller and ending up in Sunderland, like some weird folkloric crossroads is ha events happening, kind of witchy events going around the Black Cat. Similarly, there's a lot of roundabouts that have standing stones. This one is outside Cribs Causeway in Bristol. Um, <laughs> which kind of suggests that roundabouts are now taking some kind of function in the local area as a, a kind of to symbolize, because this is right next to a shopping center. My idea is this symbolizes the Neolithic origins of capitalism and commerce, that from the time we started farming and hoarding crops for the future, this would be inevitable that we'd have massive shopping centers. Uh, when you look at actual retail parks and their things anyway, you do get this kind of 2001 junction between the old and the new, these great monolithic slabs of retail uh, this is the uh, Leighton Mills Retail Park in London. This is the cool roundabout, which has a, a proper stone circle on it. This is in Glen Rothes in Scotland, in Fife. And this is quite a powerful stone circle. This is right in the middle of four uh, lanes that come in with really long roads through huge avenues of evergreen trees. So it's quite has quite an effect, probably the sort of effect you'd imagine the original stone circles would have had. Now nearby, there's a place called Balfour Henge, um, which this is surrounded here by a housing estate, and it was an original prehistoric monument with timber posts and various things. It was a burial tomb, I think, in the, in the center that boy was found in, uh, bones of a boy. And this has now been sort of preserved, but there's only really three or four stones there. One of my, when I walked around Balfour Henge, it was, it felt very much like a heritage thing. It felt like a little piece of history. So you read the board and you kind of get a sense of it, you walk around. It was fine, but I much prefer this one. So the cool roundabout feels like it feels like a piece of uh, sculpture that's alive, that has sort of resounding with the energies of the cars going around it, that has some kind of function that tells people about the town that could be seen, that's a landmark. So it felt to me like these kind of things, whilst you could say they're inauthentic, I'm not sure. I think they might be mundane, but they're also beautiful and powerful. And perhaps they have more of a function than these ancient sites. They still have a place. The final uh, thing I want to show you today, I think I'll check on the time. Just about, I think we've got time. Yeah, right. Um, is my love of the M6. So the M6 uh, was my route from Glossop up to Scotland to see my grandparents, because um, my original family from Scotland. And so it was like this sort of ritualistic thing every, every sort of six weeks, wherever we were, 12 weeks, we'd get in the car and uh, we'd have that beautiful thing of, the lights shimmering in the, in, the, in the roof of the car as I kind of lulled into sleep in the back, eating sweets and stopping at service stations. And then later on, it became a kind of thoroughfare that I used a lot when I was going to see my girlfriend, when I lived up in Cardiff, when I had to go north, and when I used to go up to Scotland as an older person. It just seemed that the M6 was this place that was always there. And then people talk about motorways as non-places, and they say they have no kind of emotional life of their own. They're, they're all the same. You could be on one motorway and you could be on another motorway. They're just the same they're not really a place in themselves. They're sort of without time, without culture nuance. But the M6 to me is, is kind of full of that. It cuts through an incredible swathe of landscape from the kind of spaghetti junction sprawl of, of Birmingham up through the kind of Midlands where it becomes technically, I think, it is, uh, I think it's, it is the most haunted road in Britain. So the M6, as it goes through the Midlands, it goes through all sorts of Roman sites and strange um, Saxon sites uh, of warfare and burial and there's been all sorts of visions of Romans wading through tarmac. And, and some people blame some of it. There's a sort of a lethal spot up towards Preston that some people blame on, uh, I think one guy classically in the Daily Mail and go, 
blames on um, occult interference. But there are kind of uh, strange things happening as you go further north. You know, you get to this uh, amazing piece of architecture here, which is like the icon of the M6, which is Sports and Services near Lancaster, which is sort of featured on infinite sort of Instagram posts. And uh, it was in Martin Parr's Boring Postcards, which is this excellent um, collection of kind of, they, they say boring postcards, but they're not boring because they, they, they're, they're of this halcyon early days of the motorway where people were going to be luxuriating in restaurants in the sky. Uh, the Beatles apparently stayed at this or had, had a meal at this. And it is really a sort of iconic and speaks of this kind of future dream that the 60s had that hasn't really quite turned out, which gives it a strange haunting quality, this idea of uh, the hauntology. If you think of hauntology as the ghost of a, a future that hasn't happened, then this is it. Um, but when I was walking around this service station, I thought, you know what, that's, that's all well and good, but maybe this is too official for an official Britain. So I kind of had a look around further down. There's a strange guy who sells CB radios and he's been doing so since Valentine's Day 1990. His name is Brian and he has all sorts of strange sort of uh, teddy bears stacked up in the, in the cabin from kids who've lost, left them in the car park. So that was quite an odd sort of retro thing to see. He's got fax machine there, which obviously we all need. Um, further away from the tower, you go into the strange edge land at the perimeter of the service station where I discovered what I, I can only call concrete henge, which is this it's, the, what is, it's surrounded by fence and properly bolted doors uh, and one of these barbed wire things that stop you from getting in or out. So it's really, they're trying to protect it at all costs. And it's there's three blocks that don't really mean anything. Now they could have been to support the structure that was there before. They could, I, look, I asked on Twitter, people came up with all sorts of theories, but no one really knew. So I love the fact that there's these inexplicable strange objects. They kind of just lurk, they're kind of remnants. It's, it's like a thing that hasn't really, it's, it's, it had a function maybe at one time and it's lost its function and then no one, maybe no one who works at the service station knows why it's there. Um, it, it, it's a Japanese artist who calls this hyper art. Hyper art is structures that used to have a purpose that have lost their purpose but now remain as pieces of interesting sculpture. I think this is a kind of classic example. What was also interesting about this motorway uh, service station is that the membrane, normally motorway service stations are kind of barricaded off because it's the motorway is the motorway with its own laws and its own rules and high prices. And normally you don't really get to see the countryside. You're not allowed to sort of nip over and camp in the field or go off to find a country pub. But this one was amazing because just next to the Premier Inn, the Travel Lodge, is this gossamer thin desire path. And suddenly you're in White Car Lane, this ancient sort of trackway and there's old sheep in the fields and you can hear the cows lowing in the distance and smell cow shit and the crunch of leaves beneath your feet. So it's one of those strange places where it felt like the, where the super modern and the old England are kind of really rub up really closely in quite a surreal way, sort of stepping between this country lane and the car park but next to the Costa Coffee and the Starbucks was really weird, it was a weird sensation. Um, right, I've got to the end. So um, thanks for listening. Sorry, it was a bit of a whistle stop tour. Those are just some, there's loads of stuff like this in the book. I've kind of skipped through a few of them but I wanted to give you a kind of flavor the different things that I was, I was covering. I think I've covered most of the chapters in there. Um, yeah, so um, I think I'll hand it over to you to do the pitching. Thank you so much for that. that was, as both services and um, car parks right up my street. Absolutely fantastic. Um, there has been lots of questions in the chat box. Uh, there's also been quite a few recommendations of uh, round of and she's definitely a first for October Books events and I'm loving it. So we have, let's have a little flick back through here. Um, uh, a comment rather than a question, oh no, a question. The first question was from Seth um, Churchill. He says, so is there a cutoff date for when folklore develops? A kind of best of any law, magic or mythology? That's a good question. I, I don't think so, but I, I, I guess it just time tells really. So it's, I think that the march of time eventually things become sort of enshrined as mythic. I think, for example, the idea of the haunted uh, council house, I think it now is maybe. I mean, there was the, the, the Conjuring 2 was about it. There's the Enfield haunting up in Pontefract. There was the Pontefract haunting. That is now, that um, council house is now an actual sort of it's been preserved in time it's still got all the 70s decor and you can hire it out for the night i don't recommend it but you can hire it out and i think maybe so these things you can tell i think when they move into 
cultural into films and into art and into stories I think maybe then you think well it's probably reached it when we start to tell these ghost stories in the public realm that's the only thing I can think to measure it really I think just things are eventually I think the, the Victorian the haunted Victorian railway line I guess Dickens kind of created that with this haunted signal thing I guess the storytellers of the time maybe make the miss and then they become sort of haunting later on as, as time passes brilliant um, we've had, uh, when you were talking about roundabouts, uh, Seth also said, I think it's Glenn Roths, I might have pronounced that wrong, that yeah, has the best that. roundabout art, love the irises. Yes, it's uh, the new, the new towns are the best for the roundabout, so it seems to be, this is the, the, the any, of, any of the new towns, new developments and new retail parks seem to be full of, um, uh, art, they seem to, as a kind of practice, they tend to do it, so the one in Bristol and Cribs Causeway, there's all sorts of roundabouts uh, and uh, there's a standing stone one. There's also one shaped like a breast and there's another one that's shaped like an anus and another one that's like a, a vagina. And apparently that's, this is true. This was, I went and inspected them all and they are erogenous zones. I think someone told me in unofficial Britain, I didn't believe them. But when I did a tour, I was like, I think they're right. I think there's something happening here. A son of sex cult operating, using roundabouts as a mode of communication in Bristol. That's hilarious. Um, uh... Angie Chapman says, a stone circle I recommend for strange juxtapositions is the Devil's Coits in Oxfordshire. It's right up against the landfill site, which I accidentally ended up walking across to get to it. Definitely makes for a strange experience. Is that one you know? I don't know that one. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, a great question uh, from Angie Chapman is, it's hard not to notice the persistence of concrete throughout the various chapters of Gareth's book. Is concrete particularly permeable to myth? Um, ooh. I, mm, yeah, I, well, I think I think so. I think I, um, John John Grindrod in his book Concretopia talks about how actually when you think about it, concrete's made of sand and all, it's all the ingredients, ancient building materials, and uh, that made castles and things. So he he, I think I quote either quote it in the book or quote, I've quoted it somewhere else. No, I did quote it in the book. Yeah, um, and I think that's. A good reason i think i think they do have the quality of castles and ancient structures and i think they are magnificent and the concrete can take on so many forms and shapes it also erodes and decays and gets stained so it kind of assumes the, the patterns and the shapes and even just the, the footsteps of the people who walk on it so i think it's quite um if you think of the stone tape theory this idea that um surfaces can retain events that have happened in their fabric well concrete is probably a good material for that yeah, there's um, somebody else has also mentioned uh, abandoned asylums seem to have become quite popular over the last decade. And I know um, sort of in Southampton, the New Forest, uh, near where I live, sort of abandoned hotels and those kind of things that are laid to pasture always sort of look uh, and feel quite, quite different, don't they? There's a lot of good, there's, I, I did some research and I didn't, in the end, I decided to use living hospitals because I just wanted to, because I knew the abandoned hospitals were so almost gothic already for that reason. I'd almost thought, God, I better do something because they're, they're perfect. They're, they are haunted. What's also, I read a few, quite a few websites and pamphlets about people's experiences in these asylums. And it's shocking until how recently these asylums were using bad treatments and where people were locked into the system, they couldn't leave. And effectively they would get put in there because they had an affair. And their husband claimed that they were and then they'll be there for the rest of their lives and by the end they were of course mad because they'd been living in this asylum so it was, i was quite horrified so i think there's a whole unofficial britain history in in these asylums i think that what makes them even more it's not just what they look like or feel like we're there there's a, there's a lot of stories there that are quite grim and i think don't think as a country we've really faced up to yet yeah 100 percent. yeah totally agree with that it's terrifyingly close to the present day um Alex has said, uh, are you familiar with the magic roundabout here in Cardiff and are there any noteworthy thin places here you can think of? I do. I used to live in Cardiff, so I used to live in Roth uh, and I know that the roundabout, um, yeah, it's amazing. And it, 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 I think it's been redone now recently. But that, that, there's that one, that's, that, that's, that's called the magic roundabout. And there's also the famous magic roundabout in Swindon, which is this crazy roundabout with roundabouts around the roundabout. Um, I think the Cardiff one's better, but yeah, it's, it's kind of it's in one of these places where art, it, it, it means something to the people there and the art, it can often get mocked or derided, but after a while people don't want to see it go. Um, Kyle mentioned earlier on uh, about contemporary roadside shrines as well. I think that was when you had the picture of the doll with the daffodils, mm. which is possibly one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen in my life. 
Uh, but yeah, you just sort of mentioned um, yeah, contemporary road roadside shrines. Yeah, I think we. Um, I remember traveling in South America in 2000, 2003 and being shocked about how many shrines there were and, and finding it strange, this idea, this sort of melancholy thing of thinking of someone died there, someone died there. But then, you know, almost 20 years on, it's happening in Britain all over the place. The same with, I wrote an essay a few years ago um, about also memorial benches for the same reason. It was about the sort of poetry of memorial benches, this strange idea of, is this the place where the person sat or not? And this idea that the viewpoint is also the you're inhabiting the view of the person who's there. I started to imagine these sort of stories coming to life. And I feel the same way with, with a lot of these shrines. As a, from a melancholy person like me, they're, they're good, but, you know, depressing sometimes. But yeah, there's lots of stories now that I think a lot, of, a lot of art used to be something that was only for the rich and famous. And now people, people can actually have monuments to their loved ones all over the place in Britain and they're kind of proliferating everywhere. It seems to be. I think it's because graveyards moved away from where people lived into these out of town cemeteries that no one ever goes to. And they're, they're really sort of sparse and weird. So people kind of want the memorials to be in the places they walk through, which is why you get sometimes you get memorial benches and supermarket car parks. It's a strange thought, isn't it? Like if if. Uh, a memorial bench is unable to be taken down because it's a shrine, like a kind of shrine or a, you know, in memorial to, to somebody. Um, but people continue to die and put up more benches. At some point, there's just going to be lo loads and loads of benches. Just all be benches, yeah. <laughs> um, had some really lovely comments in the chat as well. Um, uh, Jackie Booth says, my tiny head is breaking here. My second and third MA art project module modules we're about a roundabout, but I'm still visiting and false shrines. But I knew nothing about your work then. This has been very interesting. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Hi, Jackie. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, a few mentions as well about um, stone circles. M6 near Preston Junction 33 has stone circles, little groups of stone Vikings on one of my favourites around my neck of the woods. It's an accident. Um, I think that might be most of the questions um possibly oh and Steph has also just said I've just realized October books is where I used to go as a student in Southampton years ago we were probably in a different place in Southampton then so I'll let you off we've moved around a bit um we've got about five ten minutes left if there's anything else from the book you'd like to cover or anything you'd like to read from it or yeah, whatever you like. No, I, think I don't know, unless, unless anyone's got any uh, yeah, any other questions, I think I've, I've kind of covered it. It's, um, yeah, hope, hope, hope you go and buy it and read it. Absolutely. Um, if, if you're interested in the car parks and the stone circle stuff, there's a lot in, in um, Car Park Life. Car Park Life was the, the thing that started the, the idea for this. Car Park Life, I was writing about ghosts and Alistair Crowley and boat law in, in Hastings for my second book. And I, I got, I kind of just one day, I got drunk and walked around the car park in Morrison's and had an epiphany. I thought this place is more, much more interesting than I thought it was. There was a, sort of, there was a crashed Mercedes with 1066 on the uh, number plate, bearing in mind I live in Hastings, which is quite weird, and Fox in the pop petrol forecourt, and just strange spectral noises and characters hanging out. And so um, I thought car parks are seen as non-places and boring, so surely if I could write about this one, maybe I can write about more. So I went across the country and every car park was interesting. And that was when I suddenly thought, well, if this works for car parks, it's got to work for a lot of the other structures. But since I've written this book, I've realised there's loads of people, you know, for example, in fields of archaeology and stuff like who are doing this anyway, who've, all, who've been looking at um, the impact and the meaning of, 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 sort of roundabouts and carriageways. And... Um, I'm not sure if he's stopped for everybody, but we've just had a bit of a glitch there. Give me a, give me a nod if you can hear Gareth. No. Okay, I'm sure he'll come back in a second. We are reaching the end at the moment anyway. Um, somebody has mentioned potentially um, starting a, a roundabout thread on Twitter. I think that would be a very, very nice idea with some photographs um, of, of roundabouts that people like. And I think um, the Twitter handle for Gareth is Brit Unofficial as well. So you can probably reach him there. It does look like he has disappeared for now, but thankfully we have reached uh, the very end of the talk. So thank you so much all for coming. It's been absolutely brilliant this evening. One of my favorite ones, I think, for October books, genuinely very, very wonderful. Um, if you would like to buy the book, I have put the um, uh, links in the chat box. Um, 
and yeah we're ready to take your order so thank you very very much indeed and hopefully see you soon thank you bye bye <laughs>